Hello, I'm Robin Gates, and welcome to this brief introduction to policy governance for nonprofit boards. Policy governance is an integrated approach to doing the most important work of most nonprofit boards, and that's governing. The approach was developed by John Carver in the 1970s, and it's been widely adapted and adopted by boards throughout the world ever since. You'll find in listening to this introduction that policy governance really has no magic to it. It's simply the application of some basic management principles to the governing work of boards. And I've found with the boards I've worked with that it has made them more effective and it's made it more rewarding to be a member of a nonprofit board. So let's get started. What do we mean by board governance? If you ask this question, you can get endless discussion and many answers. People do have different definitions of what governance means for boards. So let's define it for our purposes here. First, it's helpful to understand that there are different types of boards. Uh, some boards are advisory and have no real governance responsibility. And some boards are there primarily for fundraising and uh, governance is, uh, may not be part of their responsibility or is a small part of their responsibility. For our purposes here, we're trying to address boards where governance is the sole or the primary responsibility. I have a, a simple definition for what board governance means in this, this context, and let's, let's go through that. The, the board's primary job is assuring that the organization produces the results expected by its owners using acceptable means. Board governance is how the board goes about controlling the organization to provide that assurance. So there are several key words here. Uh, the first is results. The organization exists to produce results, and that's what the board needs to be sure occurs. Uh, the other important word here is owners. Boards act on behalf of owners. And in some cases that's simple to uh, identify in a case, for example, of a membership organization. But many boards are represent a broader public and the ownership is more diverse. A third, acceptable means. Boards want results to be achieved but they don't want it done at any cost. So we don't want organizations to act imprudently um, uh, and do things that they should not be doing in order to achieve results. So that's what's meant by acceptable means. And then the, the last important word here is controlling because governance is about how the board goes and exerts control on the organization so that it can achieve results within those acceptable means. So the board uses processes, policies, procedures to provide that assurance, and that's what we're going to be exploring. Why should we have a system at all for governance? Uh, why not simply let the board do its job in a less structured manner? Well, the reason is that boards, uh, without some structure for their governing activities, uh, I think will tend to lose their way. The policy governance system was designed in part to um, overcome that problem and to overcome some, some common board dysfunctions. I've listed a few here which most people who have been on boards are likely to recognize. First are ineffective or inefficient meetings. The purpose of the meeting may not be clear uh, there might be lots of interesting discussion going on, but you're left at the end of the meeting wondering if you really accomplished anything. Another common uh, dysfunction is a board that is simply a rubber stamp for the CEO. The CEO brings items to the board uh, for their approval and everybody nods in agreement and there's really no uh, meaningful discussion um, or difference of uh, opinion. Alternatively, you can have a board that um, or certain board members that are micromanaging and try to get into the details of what's happening in the organization and um, provide very specific direction. 
And finally, there can be lack of alignment where you've got board members who are uh, have very different views and uh, don't agree and who work at cross purposes, and there's not a way to bring them together in a common board um, position. So I think we'll see uh, as we go through the governance um, policy governance system how it addresses some of these common board problems. Let's take a look at the big picture here. Keep in mind that policy governance is the way the board provides uh, direction and establishes the relationship with its only employee, which who is the, the CEO or the executive uh, director. There are several com core components of the policy governance approach, and each gets written formally as policies once they have been uh, developed. We start at the top of the diagram with the ends. And the ends are the results or the, the benefits that the owners of the organization intend and expect out of the organization. And the board establishes these ends policies and they provide the focus for the CEO. It then becomes the CEO's job to lead and manage the organization to achieve these, achieve these ends. With the focus provided by the ends policies, the board then has the job of assuring that the CEO and the organization do not act imprudently. And this can be a whole range uh, of actions. Um, uh, some could be just acting, uh, making sure they don't act illegally uh, or take on uh, more risk than the board would like to take on or fail to do something that is critical to the success of the organization. So by providing these boundaries, which the CEO can't exceed, the CEO then is empowered within those to do whatever they um, uh, exercise their own judgment in carrying out um, the operations of the organization to achieve those ends. Then the last step is for the board to monitor compliance with the policies. So it needs to know whether the ends are being achieved or there's being progress uh, being made toward those ends. And you also, they also need to know that the boundaries are not being um, exceeded and that the organization is not acting imprudently. So it really comes down to a fairly uh, simple conceptually a system where you establish uh, what's to be achieved, you establish what is unacceptable in terms of action, and then you monitor uh, the results in compliance with those policies. So the CEO ends up empowered and the board is carrying out its responsibility to the owners to get results uh, in an acceptable way. So we'll now go and look a little bit more detail at each one of these components. Let's look a little more closely at ENDS policies. Boards write ENDS policies to establish the reason for the organization to exist. So nonprofit organizations exist to have a positive impact for someone. And it's helpful as we think about this to separate and make a distinction between ends and means. Organizations don't exist to perform activities, for example, delivering a service. Rather, they exist to produce benefits for someone. And the activities the organization undertakes are how the results are produced. By establishing ends, having the board establish ends, helps the organization focus on what's truly important. And it, it helps avoid this common error of focusing the board's governance on the day-to-day -day activities of the organization. Focusing on the ends allows it to be brought, uh, the discussion to be brought to a higher level and focused on what uh, really the impact of the organization is. ENDS policies also are critical to helping this, uh, hold the CEO accountable. 
We want the CEOs or the executive director to be accountable for getting results. Extending effort and having good intentions really aren't, um, aren't enough. There are a number of guidelines for writing ends policies, and we don't have time to get into um, all of those uh, here. The simplest guidance is to write policies to answer these three questions. What benefit or good will result from the activities of the organization? Who benefits from these activities? And what should it cost to achieve the benefits? So in writing ends policies, uh, it's important to keep it simple. There should be a clear and unambiguous understanding among all the board members and the CEO about what the ends policies mean. We've just talked about boards determining the ends or expected results for the organization. Now we're going to turn to how boards exercise their oversight on how the organization actually achieves those uh, ends. This can be a challenging uh, part of governing because boards need to walk a middle path between letting the CEO do whatever they want and essentially be a rubber stamp board and uh, trying to do the work of the CEO and make the day-to-day -day management decisions. Executive limitation policies provide a practical means for achieving the board achieving control without micromanaging the organization. It's a key part of the board's job to assure that the organization does not act imprudently. In fact, many boards focus on this role, sometimes at the expense of establishing ends. Imprudent in this sense uh, can mean uh, something illegal or unethical, but it can also cover activities where failure to, to act would be considered imprudent. Executive limitations work by defining and prohibiting these imprudent actions. And the limitations are commonly worded uh, negatively. Uh, so shall not or shall not fail to. Uh, uh, two examples on the slide here that the CEO shall not spend more than is received in revenue or the CEO shall not fail to protect staff from unsafe conditions. The reason to word limitations in this way is to avoid having the board by policy tell the CEO everything they must do. By telling the CEO what should be avoided, the board is also telling the CEO that everything else is acceptable. So this empowers the CEO. It avoids the micromanaging and second guessing that uh, can go on, but without abandoning the board's responsibility to guard against imprudent behavior. Now we get to monitoring. A board can have great policies, but they're missing an important part of their job if they don't do the monitoring necessary to know whether the policies are being followed. Monitoring is really necessary uh, to hold the CEO accountable. Without monitoring, the uh, board really has no factual basis for saying the CEO is doing a good job or not. Uh, importantly, the performance of the organization and the performance of the CEO are one and the same. The board's delegated to the CEO the responsibility for running the organization. So you should not have a situation where you have a, a CEO that the board is saying is very successful and doing a great job, but the organization is failing. Monitoring provides a mechanism for having the conversation with the CEO about performance in various areas and identifying the need for a corrective action. So it's a really essential part of helping an organization improve its performance. There are three basic monitoring methods that boards use. The first and most common is a CEO report. This is where the CEO interprets the board policy in operational terms and provides information and data to show whether they are meeting the policy or not. 
The second is direct inspection, where the board or a member of the board checks to see whether a policy is being followed. For example, if the board has a policy saying that the CEO shall not fail to operate without a succession plan, a board member uh, or the board would, uh, could ask for that succession plan and actually look at it to see whether it's uh, sufficient or not. A, th a third method is the external review. Uh, an excellent example of this would be your annual financial audit where you have an outside accounting firm come and look at the books and attest to their accuracy. It's a good practice to have a schedule for monitoring where you identify uh, how each policy is going to be monitored and when so that everybody's on the same page about what the expectations are here. The monitoring process is complicated for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that there's interpretation of the policy that needs to be done often by the CEO. And then there's the complexity of getting information and specifically data that shows how the organization is performing. So it's commonly an iterative process where you go through looking at different ways of monitoring performance and making adjustments over over time until you get to a place where everybody is comfortable that the monitoring is appropriate for the policy that you have. This has been a brief introduction to the core elements of policy governance. There's a lot more to learn, but hopefully this has given you a good start in thinking about and applying policy governance to make your board more effective. I'd like to leave you with a couple key thoughts. One is having a system for governance will help your board be more effective and is a much better approach than just doing it on an ad hoc basis. Start by establishing the ends or results that you're expecting from the organization. If you don't have that, then you really don't know where the organization should be headed. And as the Cheshire Cat said to Alice in Alice in Wonderland, as, as she was lost, that if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there. Next, establish what the board considers to be the actions or lack of actions that the board considers to be imprudent or unacceptable. These then provide the limitations that you put on the organization and the CEO and empower them to achieve the uh, results that you've defined. Finally, monitor your progress. Progress both toward achieving the ends that you've established, as well as living within the limitations you've provided to the CEO. That's an iterative process where you monitor, you see about compliance, you make mid-course uh, corrections, and that's the way organizations get better. The concept is simple. The board fulfills its responsibilities to the owners of the organization and it empowers the CEO to achieve the ends that you want within acceptable means. There's a lot of work and some practice that's necessary to put this in place. It is time and effort well spent if you want your organization to make a difference. Thank you for watching.